Uh. <laughs> you got two vape devices. <laughs> All of the vape. All of the vape. I was thinking some, that we start all our podcasts with like half of a joke or a story that then we transition and like, oh, we're starting. Okay. And then people, people are like, well, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> and the story continues across episodes. Anyway. A little planning and Just then. Just a little thought. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we include this part. That'd be weird. It's that they had some, it's in Austin Powers, right? Where he and his dad uh, are like chatting in like Cockney rhyming slang. And you yeah. don't know what they're saying. And at the end they go, and then she shat on a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. Yeah. That's a new tagline. She shat on, on a, a turtle. turtle. Mahalo, dear listeners and viewers on YouTube, which I'm going to look at the camera, which you're not supposed to do breaking the fourth wall, I guess. But I mean, less, less of a problem in non-drama. Podcast yeah, I don't think it's a big fine. problem. No. I think YouTubers do <laughs> often look at the, the camera. Illusion. No, hello, the hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the show. Beautiful HD. Mm, like we could do 4K. Actually, we could do 4.6K, but I just don't have enough memory cards nor an errand boy to swap them out as we run out of storage. I, mean, I don't think I've got enough like flesh pixels for 4.6K. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alarmed at what that Dis- would mean. You discover you're not real. As no, like <laughs> start to see the. Well, it's gonna, is it going to get high enough res? We start seeing the space between our atoms. <gasps> I don't think I want well, that. The resolution would have to be pretty astronomical for that. It's coming. There's also a problem that is intrinsic of um, using normal microscope to view anything, which is you're using light to look at it. Okay. So you're limited by the wavelength of light. So I hate that. I hate being limited by the wavelength of light. Basically, light as a wave spans certain large, certain size gaps depending mm-hmm. on the frequency of the light. And that means that anything that's smaller than that hop cannot be seen b- by that resolution. And that's why the aliens are already here watching us. Mm. Uh, we're Voices in the Dark. I'm Dre. I'm John. <laughs> we're learning how to human and... Uh, and how to look through a microscope. <laughs> a microscope. I mean, we can barely handle having a camera in the room, so... Yeah, well, we're doing better. Hey, here's a great microscope quote for you to begin uh, from a Tom McRae song. Um, if hell is in the detail, babe, I'm a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> Let's reflect on that one for a little bit. Wait, but is he, he trying? Is he tr- was he trying to say that he's like the most hellish thing there is? No, no. Or was he trying to say that he finds hell? He's finding the hell everywhere okay. through the over analysis. Okay, so he did use that correctly. I was afraid that he used that like no, no. in a Luddite sort of way. No, he's be- he's beyond that that okay. level. So over analysis is seeing hell, and we're now going to over analyze the letters of Seneca. This is the next episode of the modern Stoic. And this is what letter number, not episode number, because we're not doing them all. Letter number 24 on despising death. Mm. Sounds like it's up your alley, but the letter's a bit more complex than that. Quite simply, it is about how to deal with and handle fear and how to find a balance between accepting death and embracing life. I like that as a conflict because that's something Mm. that I've tried to figure out for myself. I don't necessarily agree with his proposed solution. Mm -hmm. I like to think it out loud. I think it'll be interesting to do that in the episode. Yeah. I'm tempted to start just singing, always look on On the the bright bright side of death. (laughs) Um, I remember. So just side note, like I I watched Life of Brian in New Zealand for the first Mm -hmm. time. I got invited uh, by my English immigrated to New Zealand friend mm-hmm. to go to his house and see uh, British comedy and well no to play Warhammer oh okay uh, with little figurines and things he was a fan he was hoping to play with somebody else he discovered that I was a nerd and he <laughs> he gave me the addiction that is little miniatures Ooh. I spent a lot of money on those but um, so I was at his house at his place and uh, in the evening they decided to put on a movie it's like oh here's an English movie and I'm like oh god Jesus Christ, like, because English film, like, as far as I was concerned, you know, I thought it was going to be the same as going to someone, I don't know, I'm probably going to offend someone here, let's pick a random country, like, if I went to a Bulgarian person's house and, like, let me show you a Bulgarian (laughs) film, I wouldn't be going, ooh, (laughs) you know, so I had the same kind of misgiving of random, strange, ethnic Ethnic shit. Yeah, well, you know, to me, you guys were... (laughs) How dare you? A strange concoction. Anyway, so... He puts it on, 
I'm like, what is this? And then so suddenly, like at some point, I'm like, and I just start laughing, and I like so much that it hurts. Like it's, it was the best thing I've ever like ever happened to me. There is there is one if there's one thing that I could be proud of being from this stupid little country, it's the comedy. <laughs> It was really, it really started my, my, my brain down like a different path. Like I, like I started looking up extra stuff and mm-hmm. anyway. And looking to figurines. Just a little bit of, yeah, well, well, well figurines. No, 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 I kept the figurines purely in the demons and skeletons and things. The comedy okay. I kept you English. didn't need to cross over. No. Um, so this, 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 who am I and what am I doing? I'm, I'm going to talk about Seneca. That's what Sorry, I'm doing. I sidetracked No, you. no, I just want, I. I just have this like that the anxiety over the the whole like I need to tell people to go check us out on socials and everything and, I'm, uh, and I know it's annoying for some people to hear so I'm like I want to get it out the way quickly yeah I'm also of two minds you know like I hear people going it's important you have to include it in every episode mm-hmm. and then I've heard Tim Ferriss go like I didn't tell anyone to do anything until my number episode blah 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 and, and I, I guess we've had enough number episodes but but he's also Tim Ferriss yeah like he's already got a good audience a big audience even if it wasn't huge to start with but now you know he's got pre-recorded the same boring trailers um that are like five six seven minutes of just like go and invest in this thing go and do this we're just asking you to help us out and grow the show uh, mm-hmm. we're not asking you to to buy anything um so if you could uh pass this on to a friend if you, you think they would enjoy it and get something out of it that's probably the best compliment of all um, and you can sort of do that at a degree of separation by giving us a five star rating and review if possible on iTunes. Um, so when we try and get cool people on the show to talk to, they check it out and go, oh, OK, OK, this is a good show. Um, let's let's get in this thing. And uh, we are I, I'm learning the Instagram. We now have V in the D dot pod. Have you decided whether you're going to be hip? Which way to be hip with it? Because you got you got to start calling it either Insta or the Gram. Ah, oh, shit! You got to pick one. Mm. And it's like Bloods and Crips. Like there will be <laughs> there will be consequences as to what I <laughs> what I do. <laughs> oh God! Uh, well, I like how it's going. Um, we started it a couple of weeks ago, and we've got uh, around up, up towards like three hundred followers at this point. Um, so that seems like pretty good going. Yeah, so, no, we're doing well. Well, you're doing well. I'm Thank not really you. posting much. Thank you so much. Me and Jamie and putting the stuff together. Um, and we started doing a thing that we should we should start again of like asking each other questions via the stories function. So we have like 15 seconds to go, what the fuck do you think about this? And then Yeah, response. I quite enjoyed doing that. And then I got caught up in, what should I ask next? Yeah, and then lost. I thought about throwing down some workout challenge, but then I thought, oh, but I'm not in shape yet. Like he'll beat every yeah, single one. <laughs> motherfucker, I will bring it on. Bring it on. But I thought about doing like slightly impractical ones that you might not have experience with can you do the jumping up the bars mm-hmm. in the gym so the way there's the monkey bars at mm-hmm. different levels can you jump from one to the next um i'm gonna say yes but okay. i don't know okay i'm just saying i would do it and i would win <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have those monkey bars available so we no? have to get some i think no they're pure gym well they've got um they're all like on the same level Oh, there's no, there's no gradient in that there's cage. No. no, I don't think so. There usually is, like at the end. In that unforgiving that steel structure. Oh, yeah, a little, a little flip. But there's yeah. like three of them. Oh, oh, three, got, three, three levels are easy. But uh, like f- f- five, it's when it starts to get. Oh my god! And then you just look down. And you're like, Can I, how do I get down again? Well, if you guys are doing that, send send us pictures of this, and that can be a challenge that we then have to overcome. Because obviously, then if we didn't then whoever posted that picture would have to take over the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. That is. Those are the rules and everyone knows them. Okay. Uh, also, facebook.com slash V in the D. Um, get in touch and chat there. And Just talk to us. Oh, if you're on YouTube watching this right now, there's a box right here that says subscribe that way i think you, it's that way unless i got mirror image in which case it's that way okay. but just <laughs> hit that fucking button <laughs> press that button um you know so that we can send you more shit we promise we won't spam actually you can't spam like the whole point of these bastard companies is that they don't give us access to your email address you know good enough like like that's good probably in most cases because there are some unscrupulous you know um x uh, corporate people turn podcasters turn weird mark online marketers that might want to send you a million emails per week. Ty Lopez. 
Sure, amongst them. Uh, but we would only be really telling you, this is our new episode, please watch it. Boop, so, boop, boop, boop. hit the button and yeah. um, we'll send you. We'll, you we'll know send when, you nothing. You'll yeah. just know when we put, just put when new we put stuff, stuff out. out. Um, yay, YouTube and all that stuff. And thank you to our Patreon supporters. Uh, really appreciate your support. That's where you can back the show directly and allow us to... Uh, without having to get boring advertising um, for for random shit, crawl out of the darkness right. into the light of making I was this full time. Rather than using it to barely cover the cost of the podcast hosting and uh, like analytics and stuff, the current Patreon mm. income, why don't we just like you know take the loss on the <laughs> on the internet shit and we go out for one nice dinner, just the two of <laughs> us, document candlelight, it. <laughs> romantic. Okay, that's yeah. sweet. Um, it w- I would feel more like we're getting sort of something more out of it. Like I, th- I would feel more connected. <laughs> taken out the... for dinner by our fans. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Maybe we will. Maybe we, we will. Should. Um, should we get on to despising death? Yes. I mean, that's kind of my default. That's what you do. The, 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 fu- the times where I'm, I know I'm in most crisis with myself is when I accept my future death. <laughs> I, I know that I have a problem and I might be depressed when I go, maybe it's okay if I die someday. Like, I know I, I, that, that's like, that's, a, that's a, like, a, oh, shit, uh, I should talk to somebody. Because it's generally a, before an emotional crisis. <laughs> it takes you that much to, I wonder how many letters are we going to have to get through of Seneca before you can accept death? Oh, but, uh, look, I mean, ultimately, death is something that you only have to accept if you have an illusion that not accepting it in some way actually prevents it. <laughs> like the mm-hmm. average person not accepting death, they're not accepting it because they were just refusing to acknowledge that they that, that it's a thing that's going to happen to them. Mm-hmm. I'm refusing to acknowledge that a thing that it's a thing that has to happen at all costs. Well, that does seem less insane now that you've you've clarified that. <laughs> you know, it's not like simply willing myself not to die or just running away from the thought like will mm-hmm. stop it from happening or makes me in any kind of like it, it's not that kind of a oh i don't want to look at that it's okay. more of a it's coming i know it's coming and i know I, there's nothing i can do about it and i have to accept it but i refuse to do so out of principle <laughs> because i know it's not impossible and also i feel like it's the mission of complex life once it achieves um sentience to remove itself from that loop and become the guardians of everything else Hmm. Well, I was going to say before you made that that distinction that we're like unhealthy on opposite ends of the spectrum, that for a lot of my life I've been like, oh, I'm going to die, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> it will be over, which is one of the themes that comes up in, in the letter, um, which which Seneca doesn't think is, a, is great either. Hmm. Um, so this one starts with a bit more like, ooh, maybe Lucilius was real kind of thing. There's a lot more of like Lucilius doing stuff in this uh, letter. Apparently, he's facing a lawsuit um, over something or other. So he's pretty worried about it, and he's hitting up his mentor like, "Oh, Seneca, what the haps? Look, I'm I'm in a difficult situation, um, and he might be facing exile or something like that as a consequence if he's if he doesn't win this case." Um, and Seneca says, "Well, first of all, I bet you're expecting me uh, to say just picture something better. Don't waste time feeling bad about things that haven't happened yet." He's like, "Well, that's true, but we've talked about this before. So actually, I'm going to take a different route to try and help you mm-hmm. understand what's going on better." I'd like to think that he said, "Psych, psych. <laughs> <laughs> you can't predict me. I'm Seneca. I'm you're so badass, yo." <clears throat> Should we reimagine him as a rapper now? We've done them in bondage. Yes, do check out um, the uh, episode 15? 14. 14. Episode 14, uh, where we have... I mean, it's not... We don't really have Seneca... Per se. Per Just se. a statue. It's, it's a statue in bondage gear. Thank you, Jamie, for putting that together. Did he enjoy doing that? Uh, he did. <laughs> he did perhaps more than you would expect. He's, uh, he's quite into the whole harness idea. Okay. But you know they're quite expensive. He wants me to wear one, and I'm like, well, only Whoa. if you get ones for sex. If you get like, I don't know, a cow harness or like a restraint for like a mental pa- health patient. Like, I could get a mental probably... health patient one, surely. <laughs> I think the cow one wouldn't fit. Oh, yeah, I suppose. I'm not a cow. Do you know this? No, no, I, I'm aware. <laughs> I, I wasn't thinking about how far the belt would have notches. <laughs> it's like a belt you have to make your own, your own holes if you get too thin. 
Um, so what Seneca says is nothing to do with cows and bondage, as far as I can tell. Um, he says, but I shall conduct you to peace of mind by another route. If you would put off all worry, assume that what you fear may happen will certainly happen in any event. Whatever the trouble may be, measure it in your own mind and estimate the amount of your fear. You will thus understand that what you fear is either insignificant or short-lived. So this is another part, another aspect of uh, Tim Ferriss's fear-setting exercise, which we talked about in a previous episode, um, which I think we call something like practical exercises for overcoming fear. So that's go check that one out if you haven't already, uh, where we'll explain all of that. This is one of the steps, imagining the worst and actually thinking through what it would really mean. Because too often we just, especially if you... Uh, heading towards a sort of depressive mindset the fear is just totally amorphous it's like a horrible statue uh, shadow that's like being cast over you and you're like oh god oh god the intensity the fear but what if you actually write down the worst that can happen generally it's not the end of the world it'd be like oh well that would be unfortunate see i was reading this and i like yeah totally i agree and then i looked at the example seneca was given Lucilius. Mm. like the worst what's the worst that could happen you could be and he starts with like exiled put to death by fire <laughs> I, mean, I know i was like yeah i don't know if i don't know if you're helping seneca like you know i think that's exactly what he fears will happen <laughs> the historical examples that he draws on and there's lots that we're not going to go into were quite extreme so i yeah i kind of went okay i'm going to ignore those examples and try and focus on the mm. level that i think that it actually helps me. like i feel like this is a tool that you know it's like you do like what's the worst could happen? You, clearly, you're not gonna be sent into exile or burned to death. You know, just Stacy from the like, you know, HR is gonna give you like a written warning. Like that's the worst oh, thing. Oh, really, Stacy. That that's what I imagined the the philosophy being applied to, like a trivial yeah. modern problem, and going, come on, what is the worst that could happen? But he seems to imply that even that is not that bad once you think about it i guess once you sort of think about what it is because also a point to probably analyze to a roman patrician a glorious death met with hmm. honor is perfectly fine thing to do it's kind of cling on right that that whole sort of oh it's terrible it would be a terrible shame to be taken prisoner but absolutely great if you know, you're not taken prisoner and you die in battle. Mm. It's like the ultimate yeah, yeah, shame yeah. to accept being taken it's, prisoner. I guess the distinction... So a Klingon's more like a Viking, hmm. like openly seeking to die with gloriously. <laughs> Whereas a Roman is more of a, I'm going to die now because they're going to catch me. So fuck them, fuck their mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do the job for them before they get a chance. It's in my hands. I'm in control. I have... The one thing you do have control... I, I suppose... It is the last like, line of control. Yeah, it's the last line of control. The last thing that is in, like, well, I guess if you're still able to. Do. Well, and that's why it's so fucking inhumane and, aim and immoral for suicide to be illegal anywhere. You know, and traditionally it has been in a, in a lot of places like here. Um, because if, if anything at all is yours, it's your life. Mm -hmm. But I'd be, it'd be interesting. So there's a couple of reasons, a couple of rationales for, so I don't believe it should be legal. Um, but I can see a couple of rationales for making it legal. Number one, um, some people are deterred by things that are illegal. <laughs> True. It would be interesting to see if some, if the, out of the, uh, let's say, public, let's say there's, I don't know, whatever number of suicides there is per year, if it was made illegal, whether that would drop by a certain percentage. And if it did, mm. wouldn't it be better to do it that, like to like, to, even though maybe the people that do still kill themselves have the additional angst. <laughs> if you saved, let's say 10% of them, would it be worth doing, even I, though it was immoral? I don't accept that that's how it would work because I think once you make something illegal that's a significant mental health problem, you put it into the shadows, it becomes something that sure. people can't come and ask for help and counseling about. It becomes like admitting, oh, I'm a criminal. Or right. would be criminal. I mean, and, and I agree. And I don't think it would make things better. But what if there was statistical analysis to prove that it did? I don't know. I think it's probably not so dissimilar from having prostitution illegal. It's going to happen makes anyway. Worse. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so you think it would still happen? Yeah, it would still mm -hmm. happen. People fuck. People kill themselves. Mm, These fair are enough. aspects of life that don't go away. But if you're trying to reduce um, the amount, I don't think that trying to orchestrate it from above 
makes sense. It also yeah. doesn't make any sense going, if you kill yourself, we're going to punish you. Like, what? <laughs> you know, you're punishing your reputation or hurting your family. Yeah, I guess it's more of an old-fashioned way of looking at things. And also, so as, as a kid, I thought that it should definitely be legal. Uh, yeah, because I was, very, I was an authoritarian. Like, I, mm. I, like, I didn't believe people should have personal sovereignty because they were all idiots to me. <laughs> the idea to give them personal sovereignty was just like, why would you do that? So what was your other reason of why you that, think? So, like whether, so it's based upon, not making it legal is based upon the understanding that we own ourselves. That is not a given. It is a philosophical decision that you've made as mm -hmm. a person. Mm -hmm. The idea that you don't belong to the state, to the nation, to earth, and therefore you're not doing something, you're not doing a violence against society by removing yourself from it. Mm, well, I think at the philosophical level of doing a violence against society, or at least the people close to you, is an interesting point of significance. But as to a question about the state, like, nah, fuck, this, the, the state's pretty recent invention compared to sure, the but body. <laughs> But it is a higher level of a hierarchical organization, which life tends to drift to. Uh, imagine it's the same as a multi, like the, the difference between single cell organism and multicellular organism. At the beginning, it was a loose cooperation. They became mm -hmm. more and more uh, dependent on each other. They gave up functions until suddenly the one cell was only a brain cell as opposed to a generalized cell. And one was only a gut cell. Mm -hmm. If the gut cell decided to kill itself, things would be fucked. Well, and that therefore there was a loss of control at the localized level to improve the organization of the greater thing that had been created. I see what you're saying, but I don't think it's a direct parallel. Like if I off myself tomorrow, I don't think that uh, society is going to be particularly badly affected. <laughs> I'm just speaking philosophically. Mm. Well, I guess that that's fitting, right? Mm. But this sort of argument too about like the state and control or it all being everything that you do is basically you need to calibrate through whether it's good for all society and that all your personal needs are in some sense made secondary it makes me want to kill myself fuck you all <laughs> true but that's the thing are we at a point a transitional point are we still a collective of single cell organisms uh, trending towards a multi-organized thing that we haven't lost enough control uh, do we need another 10,000 years of becoming slightly less intelligent and more dependent mm -hmm. <laughs> to then suddenly go, well, this is fine. Everything's fine. This is fine. <laughs> I'll tell you a more a personal um, story um, just the other day. So because for regular listeners who know, depression, mental health issues have been a big thing for me for many years. And so there's been plenty of occasions where I've said to people close to me, um, oh, I wish I was dead. And... Then the other day, uh, Jamie was pretty depressed and ill and fed up and said, you know, just in that way, like, oh, I just wish that I, I didn't exist. And I don't really think I've been quite on the receiving end of that before because I found it so painful to hear. It is awful. Mm. It is truly awful. I've had three people I truly care about say it to me mm. you're included thanks <laughs> i'm on the list is it there's a difference between like some random person and you're going oh that's unfortunate mm. and someone you're like no but i want you here don't go anywhere what are you doing it also was poignant because it wasn't simply from a place of no i want you in my life here it was yeah. also but you're amazing. Yeah. Like, what a terrible thing not to continue growing in your amazingness in this world. Yeah. But that is essentially the reason I befriended you. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I remember having a conversation with you post London no Real Focus Group, and we were like, the, the, that topic had come up. Like, I, I can't remember exactly what we what was said, but I, I just remember the the thought of this human's worth existing it, the world is better with him in it i should do something about it well, i hope people are watching on youtube to see me blush <laughs> <laughs> but that was an interesting educational moment mm. for me i guess that um yeah well i guess it's also a personal moment so i'll take the spotlight away from away from jamie he was just it was a it was a bad stress moment yeah. not not like a massive thing it just struck me that i hadn't been able to really before reflect on 
the impact of me saying those things. But I think I have a right to say those things. Yes. But I also didn't experience quite uh, the way I had seen it before was more like stop trying to make this about you, other person who's saying no, because I would be upset. Mm. But I think it's a different level if it's not like, no, it's not just I would be upset. It's, it's quite like, powerful to be like, oh, so this is what they were feeling. Mm. Shit. Mm -hmm. Like it's uh, even if you still believe in that right and that sovereignty of being able to express it and wanting to go ahead with it, regardless of what the other person thinks or feels being able to relate and not just in an abstract logical way but mm. to have the emotional empathy to be like this is the feeling they had fuck yeah insight hashtag insight mm. if i hashtag it it's not such a big deal <laughs> um, so back to the letter and about fear and that if you measure it you can make it more something you can deal with and realize it's probably not as uh, intense as you think it was uh i had just been listening to and editing a interview with the playwright mentor spiritual teacher jeff thompson um for the high existence podcast which will probably be out by the time um you're hearing this so if you want to check it out go go to highexistence.com and have a look um and he said one of the the big things about fear is that we don't even tend to admit that we are afraid like we, he was creating a fear pyramid so he would face his lower level fears like spiders all the way up to the top one by one of like a fear of physical violence and he said well what, you can put those in the pyramid but what he experienced by going through this was discovering fears that he'd never thought of as fears they, they come out as reasons or, or rationales instead like I can't quit my job because I have a family I have responsibilities even though you desperately want to quit your job and it's not really because you have responsibilities or a family. It's because you're scared. You have fear about taking this step and the possible consequences of disrupting that regular paycheck coming sure. in. And until you face that and realize that it's fear, all you're seeing is this shadow that's cast on the wall rather than looking at what's casting it. Are people truly that non-self-reflective to not realize that like, oh, yeah. I can't leave this job because I have responsibilities that I'm afraid of not being able to fulfill. I think people don't make that jump. And I think I often don't too, that it's like, it can feel more like here's a, I feel trapped in a situation and it's like, oh, I've got my pro and con sheet in front of me about take the step or don't take the step without just admitting, oh, it's fucking scary because mm. I don't know what would happen exactly. Mm. So fear. <laughs> Fear, the mind killer. So we get lots of examples that uh, we don't need to go into about possibly being burnt and, and everything like that. Let's not have any burnings here, apart from people we don't like. Um, I wonder if we need more words. I'm, I'm sure actually there is more words that we're not, like, as a modern society, making use of. Because I feel yep. like we use the same word for... There is a shark. I have a sensation that it's telling me I, with all my fiber of my being to get out of the water mm -hmm. to uh, the same. We use the same word for someone that throughout the day, even though they live in Bristol, constantly thinks about how terrifying sharks are. Mm -hmm. Well, I think surely that shouldn't be the same word. <laughs> I think that we do have different words. And I try at least when I'm trying to understand or express my own feelings to try and find ones which seem fitting like instead of saying i'm horrified by this that you could say just in everyday speech maybe like well yeah i think i have a sense of anxiety over this particular thing oh i like that much better like yeah. it, it depends but the i think part of the the, the problem all, that you're highlighting is that we tend towards kind of by by letting out the pressure of it by expressing it we'll use more exaggerated language because it feels like a bigger like oh let me just release that but i think conversely i i think in fact you'll feel better if you take more careful stock and don't say it's terrifying and say go well yeah it's it's a bit unsettling having this thing mm in well, my mind i think essentially the the, the 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 difference to me cognitively was between what i consider fear which is a response a reflex mm -hmm. to a stimulus 
and the other kind which seems to be a modern concept of constant anxiety around a mental loop that you're unable to break out of mm -hmm. around a fear that you might have imagined or experienced once okay well then we do tend to have other words like clinical terms for that sort of thing right like a sort of compulsive it's a disorder yeah but i think we should go back to having poetic language to describe emotions and conditions rather than having to resort to scientific ones scientific ones are good for being brutally clinical mm -hmm. in the face of analyzing data they're not useful for trying to teach normal human beings to relate to each other yeah i wonder how that fits with something like cognitive behavioral therapy because that is a sort of let's logic and science you out of your destructive negative thought patterns i also think it de-responsibilizes people they they treat it as a mad like a weird logical magic mm -hmm. like i have clinical bipolar disorder with uh touches of like you know like it, mm -hmm. it seems like it's it, it it almost seems like a prayer to the i accept that i have no control over what i'm doing it, i agree it, as opposed to you know i have been feeling melancholy and i've let anxiety uh touch my solipsis with like you <laughs> know like being able to whatever like I'm, i probably used that the last one incorrectly because i actually can't remember what it means but um there's such a beautiful fabric of language that we're not utilizing to describe what happens to us. Yes. I think that there's also just a simple thing that people can try out. If, if you currently think, I, I'm, a, I'm a depressive, I have depression, you say, well, uh, instead, like, I'm experiencing depression. It's That's an, the other thing. Yeah, it's yeah. an experience. It's not, it's not an identity. Yeah. And I think as soon as you turn it into an identity, you lock yourself in the box. And it does take away some sense of responsibility to, to try and improve things and help yourself. You're like, well, this is who I am. And I've been there and put myself in that box. And it's sort of momentarily liberating. But ultimately, you're like, I'm so free in this box. Mm -hmm. Just rem like to our audience, remember that it is a box you've created. There's no such thing as the self. It doesn't exist. It's a software program designed to keep you alive. Because if you can't tell the difference between you and the table, you're <laughs> going to run into problems the same way if you can't tell the difference between you and the thing that's about to eat you. Conversely, sometimes it breaks down or it goes incorrectly. When you add you know, sentience and cognitive capability to abstract on top of that, then you have a creature that's able to analyze its own perception to itself. And it gets it very, very wrong <laughs> and very, very confused. But ultimately, you choose what you are because you're nothing. Like you don't truly exist as a thing. You are a conglomerate, a conglomerate of little things cooperating together that have fooled a greater software program that knows that it exists into thinking that it exists with some sort of identity but that's like not your objective <laughs> yeah just like my mom <laughs> yeah it's very that's that's kind of the the core of uh, one of the, the 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 hardest things to get in buddhism as well is the recognition that you don't exist that you are just a series of stories which are being put onto these different aggregates of different things hmm. and we know this because sometimes people fall over bang their head and they become a different person hmm because the, a part of their brain necessary to weave that other story together has been broken. So a new story gets constructed and suddenly, uh, like Phineas Gage uh, is with the, the, the textbook example, some railroad worker that there was some sort of explosion and a rail spike went through his eye socket out of the other side yeah, of his brain. Yeah, about this. And he changed his personality, became the most horrible cunt in the universe. <laughs> Um, but it'd be like truly different person. It's not like, oh, it's the same guy and he's become horrible, but it was a different consciousness because mm. like the, the brain was damaged in such a way that the consciousness that got constructed afterwards from what was left over was a different person. When I read that example in a book, it was, um, it was described in this kind of comedic way. Like, uh, he then managed to successfully catch the rod with his face. <laughs> <laughs> So the takeaway message from these bits uh, of historical examples that we're not getting into is it seemed to me that, that Seneca's takeaway was you, when you have something to fear, um, you can act like the greats in history and act as though it's beneath your notice. It's kind of like rise above it. And so to despise death seems to mean that you act as though it's nothing. 
like it's beneath my notice. I don't give a fuck. Um, I don't think that really solves the problem a lot of the time. And it can mean that you're maybe not, if you're so, if it's so beneath you and you're not noticing, you can still, you, like you can go, I, I don't notice traffic and then you get hit by a bus. I mean, there, are, there is a level at which you do need to notice when there are dangers around you. And this idea that more like average people have that you can logic, logic yourself out of fear and depression that depressive people hate oh, yes. isn't true in most cases. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that I've done it to myself a couple of times. You logged it to yourself out. Out of extreme grief or depression or like, like mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I, I followed a mental loop to unknit myself out of that mental loop. Is this because you're weird? Loop. Probably. Also, Bertrand Russell apparently successfully did it, the mm -hmm. great philosopher and thinker. But once again a highly rational analytical mind capable of basically following his own well, thoughts. It's like being able to talk to yourself in your own language and say, for me, that doesn't work because I think my language is much more emotional. It's not that it would be impossible to you, but you don't necessarily have the tools and the right framework to find that path out mm -hmm. of it. And it's also extremely hard. It's not pleasant anyway, even if you can't, if you, even if you can do it. Cause, and, and it's not in fact every time. There's been times where I couldn't get out mm -hmm. of it. I mean, it makes me think, too, that, say, you could, someone could tell me a story or even be trying to, like, counsel me in some way in Russian, and I could understand what they're saying and so on, but it probably wouldn't hit me with the same deeper, poignant understanding and connection right. as if it's in English. But, so, but conversely, I want, to, I want you to sort of get a sense of what it might be like uh, by comparing it to something you had experience with. Okay. During a psychedelic trip, during an ayahuasca trip, those moments where you hear the solution to your problem and you, you're like, oh, I do this because, and you let go of it. Yeah, well, the deeper thing I always see is a distinction between intellectual and emotional understanding, that it's like the right. same message that I had known intellectually, but it didn't hit home. I didn't have that sense of release or acceptance or deep knowing. And that's it. And then the emotional yeah. component comes in where you just go, oh, I get it now. Yeah. And it's, it's barely possible to articulate. The ability to do it to yourself is when you're able to use the logical, wordy part of the brain to operate on some level the emotional side as well. So the, mm -hmm. the, you have some connection and you're capable of narrating to the emotional side the solution instead of having it come from a moving psychedelic experience mm -hmm. or like a near-death experience. Like you're able to put, this, put the, like an input in mm -hmm. yourself. That, that, that's all it is. No, oh, it, it makes sense. Um, but, you know, then you'd miss out on the psychedelic fun. Yeah. Like, why would you want to <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> um, Seneca tells us to move, he moves on to say, like, you should plumb the depths of fear to realize that it's just a shadow. So I took this, this quote. Um, Therefore, when your enemy threatens, listen unconcernedly. Although your conscience makes you confident, yet, since many things have weight which are outside your case, in this case his legal case, both hope for that which is utterly just and prepare yourself against that which is utterly unjust. Remember, however, before all else, to strip things of all that disturbs and confuses and to see what each is at bottom. You will then comprehend that they contain nothing fearful except the actual fear. So it's like strip away all the, the excess, like know that you can hope that something just will happen, but be prepared for the unjust to happen. Mm -hmm. But strip it away and look in essence and, and what do we see? Well, it sounds like nothing to fear except fear itself. Oh, dear God. <laughs> which is an iconic phrase. And yet and there's something to it. Like uh, at one point, it's just a tautology. But uh, another aspect is... Fear feeds on fear. It's sort of like a self-generating, self-growing thing. Mm. If you end up in the fear mindset, you can just spiral out of control by suddenly applying that filter to anything and everything that you look at. Fear is a tool. Like once, it, once again, to me, it comes down to the concept of stop using the same tool to do everything with. Like, well... <laughs> But ultimately, it's this weird thing human beings have to just grab a concept that kind of works for them in one situation and suddenly going, this is great. 
I'm gonna screwdriver everything. Mm. My lunch. <laughs> my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> like she's like, I'm not a Phillips head, stop. It's got a purpose and application. That's what it's for. Fear is something fearful happens. <gasps> I feel so uncomfortable that I'm going to take action mm -hmm. in the moment. That's what it's designed for. The moment you're like, well, this is pretty neat. I'm just going to constantly feel it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a problem. Yeah. Yes. Moderation and recognizing the suitable context for whichever reaction it is. Yeah. Um, the big point then comes next, which is kind of the turning point where I thought, oh, yeah, I want to talk about this letter because the previous stuff oh, is okay. like interesting, but I felt like it's sort of... Yeah, some of it we've been through before. So uh, Seneca asks in his provocative style, what, have you only at this moment learned that death is hanging over your head? At this moment, exile? At this moment, grief? You were born to these perils. Let us think of everything that can happen as something which will happen. So I find it interesting because I think what he's saying is that we're always at peril of just about anything happening. It's, the, it's in the realm of possibility that these things can happen at any point. So it seems clearly a matter of focus that, that can change. Where we put our focus changes the way that we experience any given situation. So you could obsess endlessly over the possibility of dying or shark attack at, at any moment, and then you're in absolute terror. But you're just as in peril overall when you don't think about it. Yeah, I mean, at any one point in time, in, in, in like we could get run over by a bus crossing the street. We you could, there could be a carbon monoxide leak out of the heating system. Yeah, like people die all the time. Some like uh, uh, the father of a client of mine a few last examples. year slipped over, banged his head in the like bathtub, and just died. Yeah, and someone I like very peripherally know basically the same story. He slipped on some stairs, gone. Boom. And that, that 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 one is terrifying to me slightly. That that, that <laughs> it reminds me that the little like you know Chance. two pound of fat or whatever it is that sits you know in our cranium is essentially jelly. Mm -hmm. That it, it's. But the point is that if you focus on that all the time, you're just going to be like <gasps> Jesus, and and then put yourself in like a padded room, and everything has to be brought to you on padded plates and <laughs> whatever else. So there's. Well, I have theorized this idea of removing oh my brain from my body, having some sort of, like, even expanding and having some sort of fully protected room at the center of a planet, mm -hmm. operating sort of avatars. <laughs> oh, so I was going to say then at least the rest of us would get some peace, but no, you've got, like, a, a legion of avatars yeah, coming so out. Yeah, if, so if they get, like, you know, destroyed by something, <laughs> like, the, 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 the command center is somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. But also, it was uh, the original thought was purely out of... Um, I theorized that the ability to expand intelligence was constrained by um, space and volume. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, by, by sorry, by speed and volume. So you can make your brain faster, but there's also, uh, I can't fit any more brain cells in here. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to solve one, pro like prob the problem the easy way, because making the brain faster has a lot of impractical mm -hmm. um, sort of things to solve. Whereas making it larger, you only, you, you just have to take it out. <laughs> And put it at the center of a planet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a well-defended planet. Will it be a lava planet? It's going to be a sexy planet. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Rainforest planet. Yeah, I suppose it should be something. Mm. You haven't thought this through. We no, need I a theme. Oh, yeah, I guess. Could it be a branded planet? It's the voices in the dark planet. <laughs> <laughs> the neon sign just glowing. <laughs> the whole world to see. Or like uh, like rings of satin, but it's like scrolling Blade Runner style, just our logo going round and round. Nice, yeah, I could I could work with it. Okay, then I'm on board for this now. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's an important point that it really hit me to go well. Okay, sometimes if I'm feeling freaked out and scared, it's a, a, a handy reminder that it's a case that I'm focusing on it, whereas the situation is totally the same anyway. Like, oh, this might go wrong. Yeah, it could, it could always possibly go wrong. If, but you could feel much better and probably do things which would be helpful towards things not going wrong by not being freaked out and focused on them. I mean, has, hasn't everyone had those str strange, like, shifts where they wake up in the morning um, 
in the morning and you're suddenly really worried about a bunch of things that yesterday you'd also thought about but you weren't worried about uh, about because for some reason you got some chemical shift you didn't sleep so well or you've let a thought cascade start but nothing objective changed at all your focus just came mm -hmm. to rest on it and so i think the point here from seneca is that you can choose where to put this focus I think it does raise the question like it's still important to ob observe and respond to things that do require attention to correct and make better, but recognize that being s like stifled and, and terrified by the possibility of something bad happening, especially like, oh, I could die. It's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, you could always die <laughs> right now. Let me, let me do an experiment. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Oh, you're still here. You're still this here. is where I find useful uh, thinking, I guess, 11 dimensionally. Okay. Um, in the sense of the multiverse. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> Not purely out of the fact that if you think about it in the sense of everything that can happen is happening in infinite parallel universes, mm -hmm. then you're... Well, actually, because they're infinite, by pure property there's an infinite number of universes that you're dying right now yes Be that, that's how infinity works mm -hmm. and yeah so that means like basically the, the the one that you're in like the just count every second like has a lucky second kind I'm of like, thing yes like, yes stop obsessing win, over it win. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so rather than thinking about what, what what might happen knowing that everything is happening all the pos all the bad possibilities all the, all the super good possibilities and most likely also like a very large number of very mediocre ones <laughs> um i think it's kind of freeing Mm -hmm. Rather than thinking it's like a roll of the die. Is it going to be six? Is it going to be one? No, it's all of the numbers. All the time. All of the time. So everything is kind of a bonus that I, I haven't had a, a, a metal rod through the eye. Yeah, essentially. Let's look up the ceiling cautiously. <laughs> um, so Seneca goes on to ask, like, what happens if the bad stuff happens? Now, I, don't, I don't really think I can follow him all the way here, but uh, here's what he says. I may become a poor man. I shall then be one among many. I may be exiled. I shall then regard myself as born in the place to which I, sh I shall be sent. They may put me in chains. What then? Am I free from bonds now? Behold this clogging burden of a body to which nature has fettered me. I shall die, you say. You mean to say, I shall cease to run the risk of sickness. I shall cease to run the risk of imprisonment. I shall cease to run the risk of death. Hum. Now, I'm down with the idea of the first bits are kind of rolling with the punches like okay so now you're poor well okay there's you know lots of people are they seem to be able to to get by let's see how we can make the best of this maybe exiled okay well now i live in a new place let's try and make the best of this find out what my life is here and create one put you in chains well okay a bit trickier he's like you're already in chains encumbered by this terrible meat body maybe you'd be more into this stupid meat body <laughs> I need to, need to transcend this chemical biological existence. But the final bit just sounds like the kind of thinking from a, a suicidal depressive, like, oh, I'll die. That means I'll be free from the risk of death or the risk of imprisonment or the risk of illness. I've had those thoughts, but it certainly wasn't a good time. It's also not a logically sound, like I'm sure you could do like a proper log logician could mm -hmm. like mathematic out why it's stupid the logicians wear capes as well it sounds like they should they probably should mm. you know those weird little equations where they they, they basically yeah. turn an argument into a letter and they're like, this is what nasim taleb does yeah. a lot like he puts out tweets where it's just like this equation and then it's just like idiots <laughs> <laughs> i love that man <laughs> You know, if P, then P1, those kinds of things. And then everyone's like, oh, no, you didn't. Mic drop. Well, is it pen drop? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Do you drop like uh, some sort of algebraic symbol <laughs> and piss off? So what's missing from this Seneca point, I think, is where the fuck is the celebration of actually living the good life? Which is what is meant to be his motivating thing here about right. living the good life. I guess for him, this is part of it. You can't live the good life without just letting go of these things. But it seems so focused on, like, no matter how shit it is, that's great. 
Yeah. And I'm no, like, no, it, it's not it great. It has echoes of Jocko Willink to me. Mm. Good. Good. <laughs> Lost everything. All your family died in a fire in front of you. You just got gang raped by a country. Good. Good. Like, mm. like, no, it's not good. Like, something good could come of it. It has ultimately. happened. And yeah. I'm going to have to learn to live with it. But like, like, like going... <laughs> going back to the concept if you could erase something bad happened to you you would mm-hmm. like at some point down the stream you might feel uncomfortable like 10 years after something horrible has happened to you if you've had a good life and you've met good people mm-hmm. to roll the dice and go back and erase it and not know where what could happen okay because you've grown and changed things yeah. are different now but at the same time knowing that you probably have on average just as good a life in a different way <laughs> should probably relieve that <laughs> yeah But yeah, it's this weird attachment to the idea that we have to like things to own them. And that is just another method of control, which really philosophy should tell us to move away from. You're trying to control things by being happy about them, by forcing yourself to accept them. Um, I think a stronger, less cowardly thing to do is to not do that. Like, sure, it's a shortcut sometimes. Taking that kind of mindset works for some people. Um, it lets them get past difficult things in an effective way, which keeps them competitive against other human beings in the world. Mm. But ultimately, I think it's a cop-out. Mic drop? I don't have a mic. My pipe drop? Pipe drop. <laughs> <laughs> pipe bomb. Um, Seneca continues in this vein a little bit uh, about, here comes, here comes the death. Um, he says, we do not suddenly fall on death, but advance towards it by slight degrees. We die every day. For every day, a little of our life is taken from us. Even when we are growing, our life is on the wane. We lose our childhood, then our boyhood, and then our youth. Counting even yesterday, all past time is lost time. The very day which we are now spending is shared between ourselves and death. <laughs> I don't think this is the healthiest way to focus because you could accept that. Okay, yes, you've got an hourglass, you know, unless unless you manage to, like, Elon Musk upgrade yourself in some way. There's an hourglass of life. Wait, he successfully upgraded himself? No, no one's told me this. <laughs> no, I'm saying maybe you will okay. do this ahead of him and you'll be like, fuck you, Elon. I knew I'd catch you. Um, but we're all- like, like I, said, I just had this image of me, like him, crawling on Mars in his spacesuit and me like standing on his hand <laughs> <laughs> crushing his hand from reaching something <laughs> no Elon now it's my time <laughs> it's on bitch <laughs> and he'll send like a Tesla war drone after you um, I don't think this is the healthiest way to focus I think it's important to accept that there is a certain span which we're meant to well meant like we can choose to find meaning in making the best of but um, we're actually, I think, still growing if we choose to. We can make the biological argument that you reach your peak in your 20s and then it's all downhill ultimately. But if you're still trying to learn and improve and change and develop, then I think that's an awful lot of stuff that it's not just everything is ebbing away as though you started with everything. No. Well, it depends what happens to you, I guess. Those things that he talks about losing, that's what happens to you with reality and disappointment (laughs) some people never lose those things because they (laughs) sail through life (laughs) some people never lose those things because they find a way to hold on to them Mm -hmm. it's it's not a given but I, i i do relate to that concept because as i have been unable to achieve my goals at the speed at which i wanted to achieve them at it has been harder to hold on to the optimism of youth um and it's been easier to become more normal in terms of confidence, um, little negative voices, things that I've never had before personally, mm. whereas people usually start out with some level of, like have started kind of appearing in my life and in my mind. And I'm going, I don't like this at all. No, it's not enjoyable. I don't know if it's really helpful either. Maybe sometimes there's a little check on like okay well maybe you have to put off the fusion drive for a while funnily enough for me it is partly derived from the knowledge that i'm going to die Mm -hmm. if i didn't have that idea in my brain i would be completely unfazed like if i was convinced that i was immortal i would not have anxiety Hmm. anxiety comes from feeling like i'm running out of time to do what i want to do Mm mm-hmm 
So yeah. to me, accepting death often means accepting failure, like said, like 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 in feeling down and feeling like I'll, I'll never get what I right. want. Which is different to how people like the feel good community would say. Instead, that means every second counts. You know, it's a it's a more sort of oh, shit. There's not many seconds left. Yeah. Well, sorry to hear that, mate. We'll keep talking about stoicism until <laughs> you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like at some point you have to start thinking, um, it's okay if I don't achieve everything on my list because I die first. I have to accept that. I kind know? of, I, I think the way I experience some of that is some of the things that I've let, have let go of, things that I wanted to achieve or do. I'm like, well... To be honest, from my perspective now, I don't think I care as much about this as I used to. And I've got some other ideas of cool stuff that is more interesting, partly because it seems more possible. Like there's the excitement of the fact that it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm focusing more on the immediate rather than on the fantastically down the line. Mm -hmm. um, we have some Epicurean Easter eggs. There's a... <laughs> We should sell those. They sound delicious. <laughs> They're very hedonistic. Um, and it's a few that uh, Seneca puts together. So Epicurus upbraids those who crave as much as those who shrink from death. It is absurd, he says, to run towards death because you are tired of life when it is your manner of life that has made you run towards death. <laughs> I really like that. It's like, it's not, like, it's not, it's like, oh, my life's so shit. I wish I was dead. It's like, well... It's your fault that your life's so shit. The way you're living it is making you want to die. Um, and then in another passage, what is so absurd as to seek death when it is through fear of death that you have robbed your life of peace? Say that again? So it's absurd to seek death because it's actually through fear of death, thinking about it, that you have robbed your life of peace. Right. And so that's kind of that weird... I was saying if you logic it out, if you actually did mm -hmm. the logic equation, it wouldn't work because like you're in that position in the first place because you're alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And also perception stops when you die. So you would never enjoy the relief of not existing. So you're more with Epicurus on this one. Yeah. Yeah. And the third one is men are so thoughtless, nay, so mad that some through fear of death force themselves to die. Which and, I don't think is just suicide. It's like, and that's been measured in like, like, like actually seen in Aboriginals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of a story actually that uh, it's a, it's a f relatively famous book that I don't remember the title of, um, um, but it is a phenomenon that's been observed. So in the story, this Aboriginal boy meets this uh, non, like English, I guess, or Australian uh, white boy and girl that are the only survivors of a plane crash or something and he's trying to help them get back to society but he's never met white people before so he's mm -hmm. on his walkabout okay so he's and, finding himself yeah. and the girl is like teenage or like preteen pubescent kind of and she's been instilled with i guess victorian or like or some kind of like uh sex is bad you know like don't like mm -hmm. blah 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 savages are kind of bad the feral anyway so this this boy kind of looking at her and kind of wanting to interact with her uh makes her horrified and she looks at him with such horror that he believes because they don't have language in common that she has seen his death she's seen his spirit oh. like a demon or something like that. i can't remember yeah. the, it's been a long time ago but so he's convinced that he's going to die because every time that things get nice between them and her guilt of like, I shouldn't be doing this crops up. She looks at him with such vehement fear that to him, that in his society, that would be like seeing a ghost. Yeah. Someone is seeing your fate. Yeah. So, so he eventually gets them pretty close to being rescued, but he dies before mm -hmm. that happens because he has willed it. Like he, he's convinced himself he's going to, and therefore he gets sick and he dies. And, and that, 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 that has happened in real life. They've seen it happen to Aboriginal people. But I mean, like uh, in our own other societies, it's such a common phenomenon. To, to, I mean, you, it used to be called like you, you died of grief, right? Where someone so close to you died and in just a matter of weeks or months, you're also dead. Yeah. And funny enough, it happens more to males. Yeah, always the victims, man. <laughs> always the victims. Well, it's this weird thing where... Um, 
I mean, once again, generalization. Women seem to be more at prey of their emotions in general throughout like a relationship. But uh, when a relationship ends, women make their peace with it much easier than men do. Is that something so, that's being studied as yeah, well? to some degree. Yeah. Like, I don't know how, how real the study is, but the, the, there seems to be a, a greater difficulty during or before for women, whereas mm. men have greater difficulty afterwards with the concept of something ending, whether it's because the relationship ended or because the other person died. Mm. And that causes more problems like it, it does have a heartbreak that there is such a thing as a heartbreak condition like like you're heart, having heart problems because of grief mm. and it is more prevalent in men because we seem to kind of can't handle shit so well no l l less I mean, that's to. why suicide rates are like what, seven times more seven times higher among men i think it'd that's be interesting one to um de correlate out all the factors to yeah. see if it's like because i'm guessing it's not a genetic thing it's not like simply being a man makes you that way it's probably more based on the way we deal with pain the way we can talk about it or not talk about it mm. and how it how we're perceived to have to handle things and sort of take them on the chin so it's more likely to be that i, I wonder if you decouple that if we're actually the same biologically or if there is for some weird reason um a gender component in that what gender being the constructed thing the you biological mean the bi oh, like so, are they <laughs> so sex so I'm, I'm gonna get really like a hate letter here if anyone <laughs> is well, watching this I, I was taking i guess i was talking about sex rather than gender yeah so the biology yeah. side i think yeah i don't think you said gender till the end yeah so just for clarification yeah, I, I, I was being like I, I was intentionally poking that bear i think <laughs> <laughs> i'm like don't poke the bear oh okay the bear's coming Comment on YouTube, everyone. The, the video's there. Um, and finally, Seneca, after like quoting these Epicurean points, frankly, I'm also on board with Epicurus on this, I think. like It's like, oh, no, my, my, my delicious drink is unenjoyable because I shat in it. So maybe don't shit in the drink. <laughs> that can be the takeaway for this. And then Seneca shit calls... The shit on the floor. <laughs> Because that's the only thing. Get swifty. You didn't listen to the lyrics. If you share drink. <laughs> you fucked up, man. Rick would be very disappointed. <laughs> Seneca calls for balance. He says, "Whichever of these ideas you ponder, you will strengthen your mind for the endurance alike of death and of life. For we need to be warned and strengthened in both directions, not to love or to hate life overmuch." Even when reason advises us to make an end of it, the impulse is not to be adopted without reflection or at headlong speed. It's like, don't go overboard either way. Don't be so wildly in love with life that you're just ignoring a lot of the realities, which will hit you at some point. And don't think that life is so terrible all the time that the only escape is going to be this wondrous thing called death. It reminds me of a quote from a movie that I never saw. I saw it in meme form. Someone posted it mm -hmm. um, with, I think, uh, the lovely Kat Dennings, who's a very buxom Buxom. young actress well, i guess she's not that young anymore well, well hopefully if she's listening she's very young very young very <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway so like a, a lovely and, and she's quite funny and she gets sort of sassy parts and i think the movie in this movie she's like the kind of not anyway like there's the popular girl and she's kind of the one that's kind of freer with sex and there's this okay. confrontation scene in the bathroom with the perceived popular kind of girl being confronted about something that's been said about her mm -hmm. and the takeaway that like the final bit is like because sex is neither as good nor as bad <laughs> as you think it is <laughs> yeah it's it, like we do that with heaps of things mm -hmm. like you know this like mythicizing it while also demonizing it and it's like the truth is somewhere in the middle where it's it's pretty lovely but it's not that good like get over yourself and i think that well, we we're planning to make a like a kind of mini series within the podcast talking about sex in various aspects. Yes. And oh, well, let us know if you want. Well, like, we're going to do it anyway. It's it's going to be consensual. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it will be it's consensual. Be, but let us know what you think about that. Do you, like like how much? What topics around sex and relationships would you like us to talk about? Because uh, mm. we're going to start you know recording these so you have a very small window of opportunity to yeah. tell us what you want to hear because otherwise you will have to put up with the fetishes that we explore oh yes and what i was thinking of there like it's neither as good nor as bad as you might think i was thinking well say say threesomes 
it can be held up as this like, oh my God, that's incredible, that's so hot. I think, well, it certainly can be, but not that hot, not as hot as you're making out because like the, it's partly the idea of the notion of doing it because it's a bit different and exciting and you imagine all these possibilities. That's like a, a hyper level of excitement. And then like with a, a lot of sex, but this is just a, an example, and what I think often makes it more fun and intimate is also there's kind of odd moments where, you know, something falls over or you fall over or something doesn't quite work. And you're like, oh, well, kind of it's not just the ecstasy of embrace that you see in, in movies or whatever. It's also like, oh, for fuck's sake, why is my mom phoning me right now? <laughs> but the human reality comes in that yeah. you're like, OK, it's not that. But also that's that's not bad. It's just interesting it's just experience going in ways you didn't expect hmm. i guess maybe for a lot of people we're at a weird point in society where a lot of people are able to vicariously experience really interesting things through media hmm. that they then like fantasize podcast. and mythologize like our podcast yeah. <laughs> whereas previously in history you might only have like you, you wouldn't you wouldn't get to see what a threesome looked like unless it happened to you hmm. so these days you get you get it but it's like you know in a movie where it looks like it's the most awesome thing to ever happen and everyone knows what they're doing yeah <laughs> it's all perfect um and but you never attain like it, there's a separation between actually doing yeah. it and 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 seeing it but we're exposed to all these experiences that we wish were part of our lives the perfect wedding or like amazing holiday like because mm. that's what we, what we consume through our media well for more of this and further filth we will be putting together <laughs> that <laughs> series um but that's it for this seneca letter it's been an interesting one debating mm. back and forth um and we'll see you same place same time next week everybody <laughs> <laughs> until then please be silly be kind and be weird <laughs>